All right, we finished up our discussion last time reviewing the mechanics of breathing and how Boyle's Law, which relates pressure and volume, drives the inspiratory process. For example, in quiet breathing, it is the increasing volume that causes the decreased pressure in the chest cavity that results in air rushing in from outside where pressure is higher to inside where pressure is lower and that's what fills the lungs. So today we're going to expand on that knowledge and talk a little bit more about the exact pressure changes that occur in the lungs and how that affects breathing. So we talked about the different muscles that drive breathing. Recall that it is the diaphragm that contracts and moves down as well as the external intercostals that move the ribs up and the sternum, the ribs outward and the sternum up. So both of those act to increase the volume. So we're going to look at a, a picture from your textbook. This is not in your PowerPoint notes, but it is on page 817 of your textbook, figure 22.12, talking about the different pressures across the lung. We're going to examine each one of these pressures, and I want you to be able to see the different terms that different animations or textbooks might use, just so you're not confused by that as you're watching the different animations online, or you maybe go into your programs if you're going into respiratory therapy. They might have different names for these. But first off, we're going to talk about you know the lung tissue itself. Um, the lung tissue is an elastic tissue, and as a result, when the lungs fill with air during inhalation, as that air is exhaled, the lungs recoil backward and to a smaller position. So the lung is made up of an elastic tissue that promotes its expansion and its recoil back toward the resting state. So there's some different pressures as a result of that. So let's talk about some of these. One is the intrapulmonary pressure. Another name for that you'll see in the animations is alveolar pressure or P and then the lower subscript here would be ALV. That's the pressure within the alveoli. And if we look at all those pressures together we can call it intrapulmonary pressure which means pressure inside the lungs. So whether we're calling it alveolar pressure or pulmonary pressure, we're talking about the pressure of those air particles inside the lungs. So on a, um, slide number 17 you'll see it says alveolar pressure changes. Again, that's the same thing as intrapulmonary pressure. It's the pressure inside the lungs. Then there's another pressure that's called intrapleural pressure. Ugh, it's hard to say these words. Intrapleural pressure, and that is the same thing as pleural pressure. So um, your textbook calls it intrapleural pressure. Other textbooks call it pleural pressure. It doesn't matter, but the key thing is that you understand that it's the pressure that occurs in the pleural space, which is that space between the parietal pleura that lines the body cavity, the pleural cavity around the lungs, and the visceral pleura, which covers the lungs. So there's two membranes that are back to back. We talked about those in lab. And there's a space between. They're filled with, a, with fluid, which is called the pleural space, and that's called pleural fluid that fills that space. Well, because the, the ribs have, and the, and the thoracic cage are lined with the parietal pleura, and then that folds back and covers the lungs to become the visceral pleura, those two membranes are tightly adhered to one another. So as the ribs expand, it pulls the lungs with it. And as a result of the expanding rib cage, just because of the ribs forming that uh, stiffness and support of the lungs, and then the recoil of the lungs wanting to pull inward, so the visceral pleura wants to move inward with the lung elasticity, pulling it inward, and the parietal pleura is pulling outward, that creates a negative pressure. Because when we take a space and we increase its volume without decreasing what's in that space, that results in a negative pressure. So the pleural pressure is always negative, this intrapleural pressure here, always negative. In addition to that, you add on the lymphatic vessels that are constantly draining this pleural fluid as it's being produced, that contributes to this negative pressure in the pleural space. And it's essential that that stay there because that provides the pull between the thorax, the, the rib cage, and the lungs. To, so when the lungs, when the rib cage expands with the external intercostals, then the lungs will follow with it. So it's important that we have this negative space and a negative pressure in the space. And if we lose that, the lungs will collapse. And then lastly is the transpulmonary pr pressure. And essentially what that is, that, that just means it's the difference between the intrapleural pressure and the intra 
pulmonary pressure or the pressure within the alveoli. So if we look at pleural pressure and, and alveolar pressure, the difference between them is the pressure across the lung wall. So we call that, your textbook calls it transpulmonary pressure. And that is basically, again, the pressure of the alveoli minus the pleural pressure. And again, that's what keeps the lungs expanded, and we'll talk about that. So we have um, a nice little diagram here showing, in a very simple way, the pressure changes that occur during breathing. So we're going to, just to keep things simple, assign the outside air, which is the barometric pressure, that's what PB stands for. Normally at sea level, that's 760 millimeters of mercury. But to keep it simple, we're just going to assign that a value of zero. So we can just compare what's happening in the alveoli um, in reference to the outside air as um, breathing occurs. So when we're not actively inhaling or exhaling, there's no movement of air, so the pressures in the outside air and in the alveoli are zero. That means, again, there's no air movement. Then, when the medulla stimulates the diaphragm to contract and the in, um, external intercostals, now we will see an increase in lung volume, as we talked about earlier, and that is going to decrease the pressure. So here we see as that process occurs, volume is increasing and pressure is decreasing and we'll just give it a value of negative one so again the exact numbers are not important here we're just trying to understand the concept so we're going to give that a value of negative one because we know the pressure in the alveoli is becoming negative compared to the outside and because zero is larger than negative one we have higher pressure outside compared to the inside and air will flow into the alveoli then as that air flows in, that's going to increase the pressure in the alveoli until it's equal. Then we have pressure in the alveoli is equal to zero, outside is equal to zero, and air stops flowing in. That's the end of inspiration. Then as that signal to those respiratory muscles stops, as a passive process, recall that that expiration just occurs naturally, these muscles relax, decreasing the volume of the lungs and if we decrease the volume we know that's going to increase the pressure in those alveoli because there's less room for those gas particles to move and that increases pressure to a positive value up to one and because one is greater than zero we're going to see a movement of air from high pressure to low pressure and again that air is going to flow out until the pressures are equal again and the pr pressure in the alveoli is equal to zero so it's just the the difference of pressure changes that is driving the flow of air. But again, it's important to understand what is causing those pressure changes. Number one, it's contraction of the muscles. Secondly, the contraction of the muscles causes an increasing uh, thoracic volume, and that's what changes the pressure. So here's an animation that pretty much just puts this picture here in motion. At the end of expiration, barometric air pressure and alveolar air pressure are equal. Therefore, no movement of air into or out of the lungs takes place. Inspiration begins with contraction of inspiratory muscles to increase thoracic volume. This results in expansion of the lungs and an increase in alveolar volume. The increased alveolar volume causes a decrease in alveolar pressure below barometric air pressure and air flows into the lungs. At the end of inspiration, the thorax and alveoli stop expanding. Air flow into the lungs causes alveolar pressure to become equal to barometric air pressure. Because the pressures become equal, no more movement of air occurs. During expiration, the volume of the thorax decreases as the diaphragm relaxes and the thorax and lungs recoil. This results in a decrease in alveolar volume and an increase in alveolar pressure. Since the alveolar pressure is now greater than barometric air pressure, air flows out of the lungs. Air continues to flow out of the lungs until alveolar pressure becomes equal to barometric right, so pressure. so we have a little quiz here that we can take just to be sure that we understand everything that was discussed here. So inspiration begins as, and see if you can answer these questions and then we'll go over them together. So pause your video and see if you can answer these on your own to check your understanding. 
So the answer to number one, inspiration begins as the diaphragm contracts. Lungs expand, lungs contract. What is the first thing that has to happen? First thing has to happen is the diaphragm has to contract because when it contracts, it moves down and then expands the space for the lungs. It allows the lungs to expand. So the result of the process of inspiration is we have air flowing in, so therefore we have increasing alveolar volume causing decreased alveolar pressure. During expiration, which of the following will happen? We're going to have decreased alveolar volume causing an increased alveolar pressure. And alveolar alveoli never attain equal pressure with the outside air. That would be false because that's what stops exhalation and ins inhalation. Um, otherwise, we would continue to inhale until our alveoli burst, and that would not allow us to survive. So yes, they become equal at the end of inspiration and expiration. And as the volume and the alveoli increases, the pressure decreases. That is a true statement according to Boyle's law. So moving back to our PowerPoint then, we'll continue with the next slide. So again, we talked about this pleural um, fluid that is contained between the parietal pleura and the visceral pleura. So that's the blue line is the parietal and the red line is the visceral. And notice as the parietal comes in near the hilum of the lung, that's where it switches over to become the visceral pleura. So this is one continuous membrane, but what it's adhered to is different. The parietal adheres to the cavity, the thoracic cavity, and will move outward with the ribs, and the visceral pleura is attached to the lungs, and as the lungs want to recoil and pull the lungs inward, it creates a negative pressure in the space here, which is the pleural cavity. And again, there's a small amount of fluid there. So when someone has, for example, pneumonia, they can get a complication called pleurisy, which results in an inflammation of these membranes, and as a result, they rub against the chest wall more than they should and causes a lot of pain with breathing. So people that have had pleurisy really have difficulty breathing because of the pain from those membranes being inflamed and rubbing against one another. So looking at factors that affect these pressures, number one, um, lung recoil, recoil, we already talked about. So when you think of recoil, think of when you, when you pull a spring apart, it recoils backwards to its resting state. That's the same thing that occurs with the connective tissue within the lungs. It tends to want to move inward. So things that cause the lungs to move inward, um, preventing um, their expansion are elastic recoil and another concept called surface tension. And what surface tension is, is water droplets that line the alveoli tend to want to form um, one complete drop. Water tends to want to stick together. And if the lining of our alveoli has this moisture, has this water layer, those water particles want to connect to one another and that would cause the alveoli to collapse. So those two forces, elastic recoil and surface tension, promote the lungs to move inward or to collapse. Luckily, we have a substance produced by some of the cells that lie in the alveoli, which is called surfactant. And surfactant is like a soap. Like a soap would break up an oil droplet, surfactant prevents that surface tension from causing those water molecules to stick together. And surfactant is a very important substance for newborns when they first are inflating those lungs after childbirth. The lungs um, aren't what if during um, early in the early newborn stage, sometimes they're not very good at producing that surfactant, particularly in premature infants, and sometimes they'll need to give them artificial surfactant um, through um, inhalation by allowing that to fill those lungs in those newborns that may not have good surfactant production. Another thing that increases surfactant production is simply deep breathing. When we have patients that are in surgery or on a lot of pain medications and they're just laying in bed, they are at risk for decreased surfactant and in, because of the surface tension of those water molecules in the alveoli, they can have some collapsing of those airways, especially deep in the lungs. So it's very, very important that we get our patients after surgery taking deep breaths and moving around so they're filling those lungs and increasing surfactant production. Very, very important. And that's why you'll see 
Um, they have a, an incentive spirometer. It's a little plastic device with a mouthpiece on it that they inhale and try to raise the bar on the little plastic um, container to encourage them to keep expanding those lungs. And it's very, very important that we encourage the patients to use those machines and not just let them sit at the bedside because it's not comfortable when people are in pain, especially if they've had surgery, it's not comfortable to take deep breaths. So as a result, they need encouragement to use that and do that. It's recommended 10 times an hour. So it's very important that patients use that to increase that surfactant production. And also during childbirth, a vaginal birth, the squeezing of the chest wall in a vaginal birth uh, actually promotes surfactant production in the newborn. So babies who were born by C-section might have a little bit of a disadvantage in those early hours after birth with surfactant production. Some doctors even say that a newborn that cries after childbirth, it's actually a good thing because you're expanding those lungs and increasing surfactant production, which reduces the um, chances of their lungs to collapse. So um, another factor acting again on the size, influencing the size of the lungs is the pleural pressure. And again, we said that's the, the fluid space. The pleural uh, cavity is the fluid space between the parietal and visceral pleura. And that negative pressure allows those alveoli to expand. And if we reduce that pressure, if there's a puncture in the lung, say a broken rib as a result of an auto accident or some trauma that punctures um, through into the lung, a gunshot wound, stabbing, um, that can cause pneumothorax and cause the negative pressure in that pleural space to become equalized with the outside air and as a result of that the lungs will collapse. So this is a graph that just shows the changing pressures. It's not important that you focus on the numbers rather than just when it's positive or when it's negative. So when we're inhaling, we can see when we inhale, that's when the ribs expand out because of the external intercostals. That is going to make that pleural pressure even more negative because it's expanding that pleural space a little bit as that rib cage is pulling outward. The parietal pleura is pulling on that visceral pleura and expanding that space a little bit and resulting in a more negative pressure during inhalation. And the alveolar pressure we know starts to decrease causing air to flow in and toward the end of that what's going to stop that inhalation is when it becomes equal again. So we can see at the depth of our, at the peak of inspiration, that alveolar pressure is a negative value. It's a negative one because we've increased the volume of the, those lungs that will decrease the pressure. And then as we finish inhalation again, it's going to become equal and then we're going to switch over to expiration. And this just talks about the volume, that obviously during inhalation, lung volume is increasing, and during expiration, lung volume is decreasing. And again, expiration, the pressure changes are going to be opposite of inspiration. So as long as you understand what's going on in inspiration, you can just deduce what would be happening in expiration, because it's an opposite process. So when we have these changes in pleural pressure, um, for example, a pleural effusion is when we have too much fluid in that pleural space. And as a result of that, it puts pressure on the lungs and the lungs can't expand as much and then those patients will be seen in the ER. So if we have a very bad infection with lots of inflammatory fluid in the lungs that can leak out into this pleural space, um, if there's lung tumors in the lungs, lung cancer, that can cause effusions where we have increased fluid in the pleural space. And also if the, we have heart failure. Heart failure, remember we talked about a little bit, will cause increased um, blood in the heart, which will back up to the lungs, which will leak out into the capillaries and leak out into this pleural space. So as a result of that, patients have a really hard time breathing. They'll come into the doctor and they'll insert a needle into the pleural space and they'll remove that fluid. And I've actually witnessed um, a parasyn or I'm sorry, a thoracentesis because it's in the thorax. I've witnessed that and they um, drew out about mm, 600 milliliters, which is about, uh, I would say, estimating about three cups of fluid that was removed from one gentleman's chest. So um, really helped with breathing as a result of that. And it's very, very common, again, um, in those with uh, lung cancer to have a problem with repeated pleural effusions. 
And another term clinically is the pneumothorax. That's where we said when that pleural space um, is no longer negative because there's been a puncture through the parietal and visceral membranes. Then we have um, the lungs collapse because there's no pull of the chest wall on the lungs during inhalation. So the lung collapses and um, that pressure equalizes with um, atmospheric pressure. So there's no pressure changes as a result of that. The lungs collapse. So here's an example of what pleural effusion would look like. See the, the right side here of this chest is a little hazy. We can see that that's just because the connective tissue of the lungs don't pick up x-ray very well. But uh, we can see that lung is expanded and there's air filling that space. So we should see nice, you know, um, open kind of black with some hazy tissue over it. Here there's fluid that has absorbed the x-ray so we can't see the lung. This is very serious. This person has a lot of fluid on the left side and probably a very, very difficult time breathing. A pneumothorax is on the right side here because see this hazy gray of the lung tissue? That means the lungs are inflated and expanded and we can see there's air in those lungs. Here it's too black. We don't see that hazy lung tissue. As a result, here is the lung. The lung has deflated and is almost along the midline here, very small. This is the collapsed lung right here. This is all open space within the chest cavity. So this would be an example of a pneumothorax. And lastly, another um, concept that results in different changing um, abilities to inhale and exhale is compliance. And compliance basically means if a person is compliant, think of it as um, if a person came into the room and said, come with me, I want you to come with me, a compliant person would follow that other person. When we talk about compliance within the lungs, think of it as the thorax, which is expanding during inhalation, is telling the lung, come with me, which means expand with the thorax. The more compliant the lung is, the more it, it, it expands. So high compliance means you have an expanding lung. The bad part about that is if we have um, an overly compliant lung, which can happen when the alveoli collapse and we have huge open air spaces in the lung and then we lose that surface tension um, and the recoil. As a result of that, we have lungs that are too expanded and you get the barrel-shaped chest and we see that in people that have emphysema or um, that COPD that you hear about on television. And that means their lungs are overly compliant, that they go with the chest cavity, but they don't come back down during exhalation. So they have a problem with trapped air, those that have emphysema, because of the missing alveoli that have been damaged from chronic cigarette smoke exposure. So the greater the compliance of a lung, the more it can expand with the lung. If it is not very compliant, that means it's rigid and does not want to follow the thorax during inhalation. And we see that in cases of pulmonary fibrosis, which just make, basically means the lung is stiff and it does not want to expand with the thorax during inhalation. If there's a lot of fluid, that fluid wants to stick together and doesn't want to expand with the thorax because it's full of fluid and that can be around or within the lung. And then respiratory distress syndrome that we see in infants that have damaged alveoli because of um, having too, too little of um, surfactant production. So I had a patient that had um, decreased compliance. They had a fibrotic lung and this was an important um, piece of physiology to understand because the, the family was upset that the patient's um, oxygen levels were decreasing and they said you know we need to put on this machine that forces air into the lung you know providing more oxygen we need to put this BiPAP machine on you know our family member and we would put the machine on but it just was not getting the results like it should and they were asking why is that we don't understand you're putting this high oxygen this high flow oxygen it used to work in the past it's not working anymore why can't why isn't this working and the reason was is because the lungs simply weren't expanding this particular patient had a fibrotic lung disease, the lungs were stiff, and you can put as much air into those lungs as you can, but if the lungs are stiff, then the lungs can't expand and that air isn't going into the alveoli and diffusing across that, that lung. So as a result, 
there is reduced diffusion, reduced ability for the, the chest cavity to expand and fill the lungs to give her enough oxygen that was in that machine, you know, providing it to her. And it took, you know, a, a pretty serious conversation to understand what pulmonary fibrosis is and how we simply can't put air into a fibrotic lung and increase her oxygen saturation. And the woman was elderly and she did pass away, but it was important for the family to understand that it was time to go to comfort cares and not have a machine that covered her entire face. The BiPAP machine is a mask that covers the forehead to the chin and it's uncomfortable, it's noisy, um, they can't eat when they have this machine on, they can't drink water when they have the machine on, it's very uncomfortable. So if you're looking at end-of-life comfort cares for people that are dying of respiratory distress, the BiPAP machine is not a very good choice. So then we switch to just keeping her comfortable with, with pain relieving, anxiety relieving medication so as her respirations went down she wasn't uncomfortable during that process. And morphine is a good medication we give patients um, to reduce that anxiety related to lack of oxygen and people simply pass away you know very comfortably. So that concludes our discussion. We'll pick up with slide number 25 with pulmonary volumes in the next video.